there's a secret about this star. The star presentation isn't really just about the star of Bethlehem. It's really about a much larger thing that begins at Christ's birth. That's the star. But it's also accompanied by the beginning of a celestial poem. The woman clothed in the sun with the new moon birthed at her feet and capped by Christ's passing on a day when there's a lunar eclipse, when the moon is again at the foot of the Virgin. But this time, a full moon, a full life, blotted out in blood. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Greetings! In the name that is above every name in both heaven and earth, the exalted perfect name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to another End Times for the Believers Bible Prophecy Update. I am reading from Genesis chapter 1, beginning in the 14th verse. And God said, and I might add what a mighty God he is indeed. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. It was on Monday this past week that I turned to this chapter 1 of Genesis and I read these passages and my heart was stirred. And I knew then that this week, I would be talking about signs, celestial signs particularly. And so I came to the 19th Psalm, beginning in verse 1, and read this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. Join with me for a moment in prayer. Dear Father, it is in the mighty name of your Son that we come before you this day with desire to receive from you your goodness and your mercy, which so often comes to us through the communication and quickening of your word to our hearts. Indeed, it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. And so we pray for each other. May we hear your voice in this day, and may there be encouragement that is imparted to those among us who will be listening to today's presentation. May they be encouraged and blessed, and may they know that you are God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so we know and understand that God has spoken to the world through various different means, one of which is through celestial signs. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And much can be said about the communication the Lord has with his people through the stars. When I got a letter in the mail, it was actually an article by a PhD astronomer that took the position of the star of Bethlehem was a real historical event. Well, it resonated immediately. I'm a lawyer, I'm not an astronomer, but I was braced by the idea that, that Christ's star was real. 
So I downloaded software from the web that allows me through with my laptop computer to animate the skies over the Mideast 2,000 years ago. And I'd go out on the, the deck after dark and tapped away for months and found the things in the article and found a whole lot more too. And as I began to find more and more and more, I began to be not frightened, but a sense of awe came to me. To the point where I realized that the star was not an isolated thing, that the star is a piece of what I now view as, as, as celestial poetry. The woman clothed in the sun that John told us of, with the, the moon birthed at her feet, so descriptive, so beautiful, in the sky at the same time as all these other events that are happening. And then to find that there's a counterpart event, that the moon is back at the foot of the Virgin on the day of Christ's death, but now it's a full moon blotted out in blood, that's the one that blew me away. When I found that, when I turned on the constellations that evening out on the deck, I wept. I had to weep. I said, my God, what did you do? Because he'd written this thing in the sky for me and for all of us. And this verse, Luke chapter 21, verse 10, speaks main, namely of God utilizing signs, celestial signs, and speaking to the world regarding the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Verse 10 of Luke chapter 21, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Once again, as I read Genesis chapter 1 and consideration of the signs, I thought of the sun and the moon and the stars. It is a category of communication that God has been communicating to us just these past 10 years or so. Signs, so many signs, some of which we have forgotten, or at least we have placed on the back burner, and yet they are so significant in themselves and help us to reaffirm the timeline upon which we are at this present time in church history. And so having these things upon my heart, being stirred that today I would be sharing on celestial signs. I turned on Tuesday and heard from one of my preferred Bible prophecy watchers and pastors, Pastor Jimmy Evans. And to my pleasant surprise, what was it that he was personally sharing on in this week's update? But signs, the two signs, the signs in the moon the signs and the stars in heaven. Luke chapter 21 and verse 25, going to the actually the second half of verse 24. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Signs in the moon, particularly blood moons. The four blood moons, which took place in 2014 and 2015, April 15th, 2014, Passover, a blood moon on 8th of October, 2014, Sukkot, Passover again on the 4th of April, 2015, and in Sukkot, 28th of September, 2015, four blood moons in all, and they all took place on Jewish holidays a tetrad, as it were, of blood moon signs. What is very interesting and significant, apart from the fact of what are the probabilities of such events taking place specifically on Jewish holidays, but the, those four blood moon signs in 24 and 2015 are the last blood moons that will fall on Jewish holidays, the four of them, for some 600 years from now. And so it's safe to say that the signs, the blood moon signs of 2014 and 2015 are the ones God intended to speak to us, at least in part, 
regarding the last days and the day of the Lord and the second coming of Jesus and the rapture. The Tetrads were on feast days, and we know that those feast days, according to Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 4, are the feasts of the Lord. They are the holy convocations, which God said we they should appoint and proclaim at appointed times, at scheduled times, that the Mohin, Mohin times. The second sign is the sign of the stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that sign is the Revelation 12 sign. It is and was an apocalyptic belief and indeed an astronomical alignment. On September 23rd, 2017, which is believed, and I personally hold firm to this belief, that it fulfilled Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. There we read, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head a garland or a crown of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Third verse, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. And that word there caught up is harpazo, the word that we refer to for the rapture. Caught up to God and his throne. Verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. The place we believe is Petra. And this establishes the timeline that the event that we are talking about right here is not a past event, but a future looking forward event. So significant was and is that Revelation 12 sign that some mistakenly interpreted that sign as being the day for the rapture to take place itself. And I want to just underscore the, the significance of that sign and just to give a little background. In 2011, it was discovered one of those individuals attributed to the discovery and using NASA software programs was a brother named Scotty and uh, I just, Scotty Clark. And uh, we followed him many years, my wife and I, and we love the dear brother and he's gone through some stuff. Please remember him in prayer. But Scotty amazingly came to that point of understanding that this event was going to take place in 2016 and 2017. The sign of the stars, the moon, and the sun. Now, I am going to read an excerpt from a volume of material that is written on Revelation 12 sign. And I'm doing this in order to establish how precise this Revelation 12 sign was regarding the last days. I'm reading, quote, On November 20th, 2016, the planet Jupiter entered the womb of the constellation Virgo, where it remained for exactly 42 weeks, the precise length of a long human gestation. The 42-week gestation is interesting in light of the 42 generations from Abraham to Christ, according to Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, and the 42 months that transpire in each of the first and second halves of the tribulation, Revelation 11 and verse 2, Revelation 13, verse 5, Daniel 7 and verse 25, among many others. A crown of 12 stars above Virgo's head is rare, 
but this is rarer still. In order for Jupiter to remain in the womb for such a lengthy and precise amount of time, it undergoes an extremely rare retrograde motion in the constellation. The planet actually appears to make a giant circle within the womb during this time before exiting on September 9th, 2017. The sign in Revelation 12 completes in verse 5 after the child is born and likewise two weeks after Jupiter exits the womb, it moves down the celestial birthing canal and the complete sign is formed in the sky. It could be said that the woman is in labor for two weeks as the baby moves out of the womb and through the canal. One can even begin to imagine what God had to do in order to order all these signs in this constellation, these stars, the sun and the moon, all to come together exactly the way it happened during 2016 and 2017. And the entire world was made aware of this Revelation 12 sign. And the whole world was reminded of Bible prophecy, and specifically the fact that we were living and are living in the last days. And though the rapture did not take place at that particular time, it impacted the world immensely then, and now it ought to even more so, as we are drawing nearer to the great events of the Harpazo. Now, we need to understand that the purpose of signs are to point to a future event or date or date or proximity or location. And so these signs, both the four blood moons and the Revelation 12 sign should in their own selves create a great firm confident sense that we are living in the end, in the very end. And yet there are other signs even more prominent than these, signs such as Israel becoming a nation in 1948, and much can be said about that. Events that are taking place in the Middle East, the alignment of nations, the, the forward movement towards a one world government. And how about pestilence? The pandemic. Interesting to recently discover that the word COVID spelled backwards is divak. In the Hebrew, it actually means possession by an evil spirit. I want to repeat that. COVID spelled backwards in the Hebrew is divak, and it means possession by an evil spirit. In September 2721, which brings us to the hidden meaning of COVID-19, on the surface, COVID-19 is an acronym for coronavirus disease, and its year of discovery is 2019. But applying the backward syntax of biblical Hebrew, COVID becomes divak, a Hebrew word again meaning possession by an evil spirit. We can't make this stuff up. Signs everywhere. There is another body of prophecy material that points to these last days. One that has not gotten as much press, if you will, or focus as it ought to, because it is so significant in itself. That is the sign of numbers. You may recall last week in our message on the Bereshit prophecy, and we briefly touched on the, the Hebrew language and how that it is, in fact, three languages in one, dealing with 22 pictorials, which are symbols that give a message, a story. And then there are 22 numbers associated with those pictorials and, of course, the phonetic, which are the words itself. But the numbers is a very significant part of prophecy, Bible prophecy. Peter put it this way, in order for us to understand the significance of numbers, he said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, 
that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So Peter is establishing a method of interpretation and how that we might look at the numbers one day, two days, that they represent thousand years each. To make this point and the significance of numbers, I am quoting from Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, where we see a very specific reference to a common pattern of numbers. Verse 32, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. They shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And the third day he shall rise again. Now, if we take that thousand number as a day and a day is a thousand years, what we have come to in terms of uh, numbers is two thousand years from the time of Christ's resurrection till today is approximately two thousand years. And what can we expect after two thousand years? I believe another resurrection on the third day after two thousand years the Lord shall resurrect again in the church, his body. Now let's look at this again in Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, where we see the significance of the third day again. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So God has instructed Moses to tell the congregation to gather together, to have clean clothes, and he is about to come down and, and manifest his glory on the third day. Again in Exodus 19 and verse 15, and he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. And verse 16, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the peoples that was in the camp trembled. Now, 2,000 years, Jesus is going to rise again in the church, the Harpazo. Is this not analogous of the very same? We see here all the, the inferences of Thessalonians, the voice of the trumpet, we see the cloud, we see the mountain exceeding loud, people trembling. Exodus 19 verse 16 tells us that on the third day, Moses went up to the mountain and God came down and manifest his glory. Is it a coincidence that God has these specific numbers a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. On the third day, God said that for a reason. Now, John chapter 2, verse 1, gives us another allusion to the rapture and the second coming, and that is in the wedding in Cana. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, these are no coincidental statements. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And what will happen in the marriage supper of the Lamb when the church is called up? It will be Christ our head and his followers, the church, to that glorious marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will partake of the wine that the Lord Jesus said when he spoke to his disciples at the Last Supper. He said, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And so do we not see another type 
in John chapter 2, verse 1 of the wedding in Cana. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, once again extrapolating these numbers as thousand-year periods, we read in verse 1 of Matthew, And after six days, or six thousand years, if you will, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Is this not, again, a, a type of the church being transfigured, our, our redemption finally coming to pass after 6,000 years? There it says it. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, representative of the church, takes them up to the mountain of the Lord, a high mountain, and there he is transfigured before their very own eyes. And I believe it is a inference of the church after 6,000 years, six days, the Lord will take us up to the high mountain, and we will be changed. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 4, share the same. There's a second method of extrapolating the numbers in a prophetic uh, manner, and that is by looking at the numbers and equating them to jubilees. Jubilee is 50. And if we take this method, we can look, for example, at, and there are many more, Jesus in the wilderness, there for 40 days and 40 nights. And what does that mean if we say 40 jubilees? We are looking at 2,000 years. Christ in the church, living in this wilderness world for some 2,000 years now before we are taken out of this world. Jesus in the wilderness there. The life of Moses himself was divided into three segments of 40s, and they, they give to us a progression of man towards God. And if you take those three 40s, what do we have? A total of 120. 120 times 50, or 120 times Jubilee, which is 50, is once again 6,000 years. And Moses' life represents the progression until finally the Mount of God, and they go into the Promised Land. Of course, there are many others. The Lord stated in Genesis, where he makes this reference that's uh, verse 3, Genesis 6, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There is no way of looking at this hundred and twenty in terms of, gen of generations. The only way that this number 120 makes sense in terms of the Lord not striving with man forever, but putting a limit to the period of time that he will be dealing, contending with man, and suffering long. And that is that we multiply that 120 times jubilee or 50, and once again, we come up with 6,000 years. And by the way, there is a book that was was a bestseller back many years now. I read it in 1977, a book written by a dear brother who is now with the Lord named Judson Cornwall. And the title was, Let Us Draw Near. And in that excellent book that dealt with worship and drawing close to God, Judson Cornwall once again brought a, a 340 segment uh, units of the outer, inner, and the mercy seats coming to God over that course of 120 times Jubilee is 6,000 years. And what do we have there at the end? The mercy seat. The Old and New Testament alike is replete with prophetic 
numbers that reflect God's plan of redeeming man and ultimately changing uh, this world and before a thousand year period of millennium. And you can take your own little study and look at the different numbers in both the Old and New Testament and extrapolate from those numbers these two principles of either a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day, or just looking at them uh, in, in terms of jubilees. And now, what about today? What about this time in church history? There are some significant events that are scheduled to take place in the very immediate future regarding them having a celestial nature. Uh, we know that on November 19th, Friday, there will be the longest lasting four hour lunar eclipse that will be over America specifically. And what does that mean? Well, it certainly means for us to be looking up. On November 19th, 2021, the moon passes into the shadow of the earth, creating an almost total lunar eclipse. At greatest eclipse, 99% of the moon's disk will be in shadow. The moon will turn mostly reddish in color, a tiny portion will still be illuminated. This lunar eclipse is visible in all of North America, as well as parts of South America, Eastern Australia, and Northeastern Asia. It's the longest lunar eclipse this century, lasting nearly 3.5 hours. The moon will be near total eclipse at 9.02 Universal Time. That translates to 4.02 a.m. Eastern Time, 3.02 Central Time, 2.02 Mountain Time, and 1.02 Pacific Time. And there's some very interesting information that has recently been risen and put together by Jewish rabbis. These rabbis are warning Biden not to divide Jerusalem. And they give an explanation of why and how that this particular uh, lunar eclipse as it is over the western part of the world is a bad omen. And that there, these rabbis feel strongly that it is specifically in regard to God speaking to the world and to this nation regarding dividing Jerusalem. We will most definitely see. There is another uh, phenomena that is occurring. What it represents, I'm not too... Sure, it will have any real impact upon uh, life as we know it at this particular time, but that is some massive asteroids that are scheduled to pass by the Earth that are massive in the sense of anywhere from 140 to 380 meters, and they are on November 20th, 21st, and the 29th. And then also on December 4th, Hanukkah, a total solar eclipse over the U.S. and other contents, which also may have some prophetic implication. Astronomers keep reassuring that no giant space rock will collide with Earth anytime soon. However, whenever there is news of large space rocks approaching the Earth or passing by, many of us get jitters. Maybe that's why the U.S. space agency NASA, in collaboration with SpaceX, is all set to launch its DART mission. A spacecraft will collide with a giant asteroid and its moonlet under this new mission to displace the celestial objects. Although an experiment, this mission would shed light on whether humans can use such technology to deflect potentially hazardous asteroids. But before NASA can launch its DART, seven massive asteroids will head towards the Earth, as per the space agency's own asteroid tracker. When we say massive, we mean the asteroids will likely be as gigantic as the Statue of Unity, lying between. A size range of 140 to 380 meters. This puts the asteroids in the potentially hazardous objects category. 
Almost all of these asteroids are of the Apollo class, meaning that their orbits around the Sun can intersect with Earth's orbital route. The bottom line is this. We are living in the last days. And the Lord Jesus told us that it would be likened unto a woman in travail giving birth, that the pains would become more intense in time and become more frequent. And we are witnessing that. So much is going on in the world today, events and circumstances that we will leave for another day that deal with the terrible unfolding of events that are going on in the world regarding the pandemic and regarding global warming and all that that infers, we are living in perilous, perilous times indeed. And it is not going away. Things are not going to get any better from a world perspective. And we ought to be praying for those that we love and praying that God will help them to see that his book, the Bible, tells us of these things, such as the pestilence and such as world government and the Revelation 12 sign and the blood moons and Israel becoming a nation, so much. And they're all converging together. And if anyone denies that we are living in the last of the last days, I don't know what adjective I might use other than the brain dead, because it is right in our face. We have to really work hard not to believe we are living in the last days. And now we come to the final portion of our message today. This is the time when we share an encouraging word. Those of you that have been following our ministry, you know that we believe that God would give us a positive, encouraging word for each of you who listen to the, our presentation each week. And it has been my expectation from the Lord. And God has not let us down. And we've been hearing from some of you in response to your communication with us and the ministry, and we are just so thankful that the Lord is indeed encouraging hearts. And uh, I am blessed to see some of the comments in that regard. So what is that encouraging word today? Well, it's twofold. The first part is a word that is directly from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Not even filtered through the apostles, though that would be sufficient in itself, for that is the sure word of God. But the word that the Lord would have me to just communicate today, I trust under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I'm praying that God will deal with your heart right now. Prepare your heart to receive this word. It's a familiar word. Don't let the familiarity of it cause it to go beyond you. And uh, this word, if you had in your Bible the words of Jesus written in red, you would find these words in that portion of the scripture. It is a great word. And here it is. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28, directly from the lips of the Lord Jesus. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now listen, we've been talking about numbers in particular, and that's what we talk about a shelf life. These numbers, we cannot change them. And all the numbers are pointing right now to this generation as being the generation that is going to witness both the rapture of the church and the great tribulation. And the Lord says that if you are a believer in him, this is a time for you to be lifting up your heads. First, he says, look up. And then he says, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Now we know we're already saved. 
Our position in Christ is already established. We are in Christ, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So we are talking about the redemption of the body. And the Lord tells us that when you see these things, not when they're all happening, but when they're beginning to happen, that it's time for us to look up and to lift up our heads because our redemption draweth nigh. Now notice there, there are two statements there. Look up first and then lift up your head because he is saying focus and then he's, he is saying what we ought to be experiencing and that is good cheer. That's what's implied there by the lifting up of your heads. A cheerful countenance as we look upwards. These words are words the Lord is calling us to joy. The oil of joy that God would just anoint each and every one of you with the oil of joy because you realize your redemption is drawing near even at the door. Soon and very, very soon, we are going to be changed and we are going to meet our bridegroom in the air at the trump of God and the loud voice of the archangel. And it could happen today. And so the first word of encouragement is be of good cheer. Now the second word is addressed to those of you who are really going through difficult times. And I suppose that most of you, if not all, are going through some challenging moments. Just the very fact of seeing what's going on in the world is in itself heartbreaking. And so this is not a cruel word of admonition that we be joyful because uh, whether we like it or not, I think oftentimes of the psalmist where it says that uh, our captors, they told us to sing a song when they said that in, by the rivers of Babylon there we wept as we remembered Zion and the captors, their, their masters told them, go on, sing the song of joy. And they said, how can we sing the song of joy? when we are in a strange land we are in captivity and, and there's a there's truth there but God is not speaking to us in that sense of be happy whether you like it or not he said number one we can be cheerful because our homecoming is before us and he also knows that we have burdens that we have needs we have cares and that brings me to the second word and this is a word for some of you to take and to run with. If you get anything at all from today's message, it may only be the truth of what is about to be spoken from the word that I'm going to share with you. It is a word that can set your heart free. It is a word that can lift the weight of the world off your shoulders, even a weight that you would think is impossible to lift since it has to do with your loved ones and circumstances, may have to do with your health, may have to do with your finances, may have to do with family, with friends. It may have to do with very personal things and you can't begin to imagine how it is that you're going to look up and be of good cheer. Well, this is how, and I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Receive this. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Cast all your care upon him, because he cares about you. He wants you to give every weight, every burden, every trouble, every thought negative, every heartache, whatever ails you, you are to cast it upon him on the basis of the knowledge that he cares for you. He cares for you personally. He knows your name. He knows every hair upon your head. There is nothing about you that he doesn't know. He knows so much more about you than you will ever know. 
He knows your thoughts you're thinking about right now. He knows where you're going to be tomorrow. He knows your uprisings and your down sittings. You're going out, you're coming in. There is nothing at all about you as a person that he does not know. And he loves you. And he invites you to cast your care upon him. Take a moment today and pray and ask God to take the burdens, the heavy weights, and it may have to do with loved ones. The Lord is able to speak a word of peace. He said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. It is a peace that passes understanding. It makes no reasonable, logical sense in the light of external circumstances. It is a peace that comes deep within because we know he cares about us. And the one who spoke the stars, the sun, the moon into existence just by virtue of his words, and then sent his son, his only begotten son, to come to a world where he would suffer and die shamefully, that one is worthy of your trust. Cast your cares upon him in Jesus' name. After today's message, I pray that you will go and you will just get on your knees, possibly if you can, and just give your heavy burdens to the Lord and be joyful because your hour of translation is before you if you are a believer. If you're not a believer, mine, sure as there is a heaven, there is a hell. And that hell is indescribable. The very fact that it will never ever cease. There will never be a moment of rest. There will never be a moment of refreshing. It will be horror upon horror. And God does not want any to go there. He wants you to be made whole and complete in Him. But you've got to do something. You've got to give your heart over to him by faith. You've got to believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to confess your faults to him. I'm not talking about listing every single one of your sins, but rather acknowledging that you are a sinner. You have gone astray and you recognize that. And today you want God by his mercy and his compassion to forgive you and to cleanse you from all your sins. And if you are, and you want to be spared the prospects of hell's fire and torment, where the Bible says the worm dieth not, then I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Repeat the words that I'm going to say, and it's not so much the exact words as it is the posture of your heart. And if you will mean this prayer from your heart, as you pray with me, God will hear your prayer and he will answer and he will forgive you because he is just and faithful to forgive us of all of our sins if we will confess to him to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does it because he said he would do it. He sent his son. Pray this prayer with me and mean it. Heavenly Father, I come to you this day confessing my faults, acknowledging that I am a sinner. And I'm praying for your forgiveness this day. I believe that Jesus came to this world to die for my sins. I believe that on the third day, according to the scriptures, he rose again from the dead in order that I might be forgiven and that his resurrection is proof of my forgiveness. I believe that today and I open my heart and I ask you, dear Lord, please come into my life Please be the Lord of my life. Please wash away all my sins. 
and make me clean in your sight. I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that he died for my sins. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God will do his part. He is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Welcome to the family of God. And now, what for some of you, and there is a joy in my own heart also, as is perhaps the most meaningful of our weekly prophecy update, is the song that we are blessed to sing, my daughter Danielle, along with myself, a duet. Today, we are going to sing a song that really has something to do with the message we have shared. It has to do with a thankful, grateful heart because of what God has done for us. You see, whatever the burden of your life may be, if you will understand the significance of the cross and what God has done for us through his son, through Calvary, and you will give thanks with a grateful heart because of what he has done through his son. May the Lord bless you as we minister this song to you this day. In Jesus' name. The longer I live, the more I realize how good God is and how kind and gracious he has been to me personally. And so my heart grows with a sense of thanksgiving. And during this time of the year, we all are sensing it's time to be thankful. And most of all, to be thankful for the gift he has given to us, which is his son, and all the blessings that encompasses I pray that you will be blessed as my daughter and I sing this duet together. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks unto the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks unto the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus. Jesus Christ, His Son. And now let the 
time be in the clouds maranatha jesus our lord he's coming and he's coming very very soon amen amen and amen